Recording in progress. Good morning, everyone. It's so good to see you guys here today. Today officially marks the last weekend webinar of 2021. And so I'm so glad that you guys are here to experience it with me. Today is December 5th, 2021, and our webinar topic is mental health and emotional health in Dong's acupuncture with Dr. Henry McCann. Today's webinar is recorded and presented by Lotus Institute of Integrative Medicine. Here at eLotus, we have been hosting edu educational courses for over two decades, and we are proud to be your source, your trusted source for premium CEU content with over 200 speakers, 700 courses, and 3,000 hours of continuing education. A little housekeeping before we get started here. Today's webinar, we are set to go from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Pacific time. Our lunch will be from 1 to 2 p.m. And we'll have two breaks in the morning and two in the afternoon. The lecture notes are available for download and you can find that on the blue course access page and the chat room. If you would like to participate in the chat room, we do ask that you set your chat to everyone or all panelists and attendees. You will see either everyone or all panelists and attendees. The latter is if you have an older version of Zoom. So again, the reason why we ask you to do this is because by default, Zoom has it set to where only the presenter and the host can see it. So that means only Henry or uh, the staff here at eLotus, only we can see your, your, whatever you're typing into the chat room. And we want everyone to be part of the conversation. So please, again, set your chat to everyone. And that way, when you're asking a question, we're all on the same page. All right, so the quiz. The quiz for today's webinar will be available tomorrow afternoon, and I will send an email out when that's ready. And the video replay will also be available tomorrow. You will get two separate emails, so one for the quiz and one for the video replay. Today's topic is very important. Uh, I've noticed that this year the common theme is mental health and emotional health, and it's something that I know a lot of people are going through or have gone through and I've experienced it as well. So it's very, today is a very special webinar for me to learn how I can help myself and how I can help my friends and family. And has become, of course, a primary focus since the pandemic began. Many people associate Dong's acupuncture with pain management. However, all acupuncture systems are capable of addressing mental and emotional concerns. And this course will cover the most important Dong points for treating mental and emotional health concerns explore mental wellness in East Asian medicine, and look at other approaches of non-acupuncture based psychological complaint management, such as Japanese practices of Nikon and Morita therapy. Our speaker today is Dr. Henry McCann, who is joining us from New Jersey. Henry has taught other master dome classes with us at eLotus, so have a look at his other courses offerings if you are interested in studying his courses and expanding your knowledge. Henry has also written Master Dome books, and he is the co-author of Practical Atlas of Dome's Acupuncture and author of Pricking the Vessels, Bloodletting Therapy in Chinese Medicine. And to add one more thing, he is a faculty member at the Pacific College of Health Sciences in New York, where he teaches medical classics, as well as other doctoral degree programs in the United States. Now, before we get started with the webinar, there was a request that we can, if we can please keep today's class discussion on Master Dong's acupuncture only, and to refrain from discussions regarding COVID or vaccinations in today's webinar. Again, our main focus today is on mental and emotional health with uh, Master Dong's acupuncture. All right, thank you guys so much for understanding. And let's go ahead and welcome Dr. Henry McCann. And Henry, you can go ahead and share your screen and your PowerPoint as well. Thank you guys. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, if you can ever can, if everyone can hear me, okay, you can just uh, give me a thumbs up or something in the chat room. All right, sounds like looks like everything's okay, sound wise. Um, that's good. Uh, so I will will uh, will pull the PowerPoint shortly, and um, you know I'll, I'll just go through. Today's topic is one I think that's really uh, quite important. Actually, pull the PowerPoint. Uh, we'll, we'll, Wait the PowerPoint for a second. It's a it's sort of a very important topic. Um, it is 
you know, I, I, I think I said this, I've said this in more than one class when I, when I teach. And, uh, and it's so true. I tell people that I'm not a therapist, I'm not a psychotherapist, but I play one on TV. In other words, even though <clears throat> I, I, was, I would assume most people in this room are not also licensed as psychotherapists where we practice Chinese medicine, some version of Chinese medicine. But yet this mind component is so essential uh, to, to what we do that it's something we have to address. And we'll look at that when we look at mind um, in Chinese medicine. Um, certainly, you know, there just as a, just as a, as a, as a, you know, a very brief introduction, this idea of dealing with, uh, with patients, mind states, emotional states or whatnot is scattered throughout the medical classics. If we look at, for example, at the eighth chapter of the Ling Shu, and I know yesterday, for those of you who were in, in attendance yesterday, we talked quite a bit about classical texts. Today, we won't be spending so much time uh, in classical texts, but I, I can't help myself. We, we're going to see some of it um, over and over again. Um, but right in the beginning of Ling Shu chapter eight, Ling Shu chapter eight, which is called Rooted in Spirit, right? So the name of chapter eight is Ban Shen. Uh, Right there in the beginning, in the first lines of chapter eight, it says, Shen bi ben yu shen, and I'll give it to you. For those of you who can read it, Shen bi ben yu, yu. Maybe I won't give it to you. I can't quite find the right character. Uh, anyway, that first that first line there, um, the the first line there. I'll just give you the the opinion. I just I'll just give you the English. Shen bi ben shen means that first uh, of all things, everything. I'm not no. I'm not. I'm not screen sharing yet. I, I'll I'll bring that up in a second. Uh, um, so that's, uh, I'll, I'll bring the, the PowerPoint up in just a second. The Shen Bi Ben Yu Shen is before you do anything else, you have to root your treatment within the Shen, within the spirit. So it just gives you a, a brief idea as to how the, the classical texts uh, discuss it. And we'll talk more about that certainly as we go through. Um, okay, let's, I'll start the screen share now. And the other impetus there, so there are a couple other impetus for this type of, uh, this, this sort of discussion. One of them is you heard Donna mention, and this is that it's obviously an important topic. And there is the, the mistaken thought out there that for some reason, the, the, you know, certain types of acupuncture do certain things. And uh, so, you know, I've heard students say, oh, you know, Master Dong's acupuncture, it's good for like pain management, um, although, you know, the, the modern trigger point people will say, oh, you can't do that because if you know you're in tr trigger point therapy, you can't do pain management, which is clearly not true. But, you know, the, there is the thing, oh, it's, you know, if it's not, if it's not Worsley acupuncture, right, then, then, then it doesn't really, you know, Worsley, you have to do that to really treat the spirit, to treat the mind. And clearly approaches like Worsley acupuncture as modern acupuncture approaches are not mentioned in ancient classics. And yet the ancient classics talk all the time, and we'll, again, we'll see more quotes as we go through this, uh, all the time about, um, about the mind and affect. So my strong, my strong suggestion here is that all systems of Chinese medicine can be used to treat all aspects of us. Because Chinese medicine is a way of looking at the human being, its interaction, our interaction with the natural world, and really at this sort of fundamental level of what does it mean to be a human? And what is the fundamental nature of disease? And by understanding that, how can we diagnose, treat, et cetera? So if we say, right, if we truly believe in a holistic medicine that you know, mind and body are, are perhaps inseparable, which I'll argue against later on when we talk about Japanese uh, systems of psychotherapy because Buddhism uh, many of these different types of Japanese psychotherapy stem from Buddhist concepts, even though they're not Buddhist methods of psychotherapy. 
Uh, thank you, Li Ping. Th thank you for pulling up the, the quote. So for those of you, the quote that I was looking, that I was trying to type inelegantly, because I haven't had enough tea yet today, Li Ping just put in the chat room. So if you want to see the original Chinese, thank you. That's that's exactly the quote. Um, so I lost my train of thought for a second. Anyway, the, the basic idea, though, is that when we're looking at Chinese medicine, Chinese medicine is a way of holistically looking at the integration of, of mind, of body, all of it. And again, like I said, in Buddhist psychotherapy, we'll argue against that perhaps because Buddhism is based in a, a culture, Indian culture is this uh, Indo-European tradition is more related to like European, what we, so it's more familiar to us. Buddhism is more familiar to us from a, Euro, a European potentially uh, background because it's not that dissimilar from some of our core classical culture to some extent, where East Asia before the introduction of Buddhism is, is somewhat different, right? So when we're looking at acupuncture and the classical texts of Chinese medicine, since these predate the, the widespread introduction of Buddhism in China, we're going to see much more of this integrated mind-body uh, concept. When we look at some of the Japanese psychotherapy, we'll see a little bit more mind and body are not the same thing, right? Um, so that's that's a, a, a little thing that we'll take a look at. And obviously, as practicing Chinese medicine, we need to be comfortable with multiple models of reality. And that's just you know how we how we live our lives. Everyone who practices Chinese medicine knows that we have to be comfortable with multiple uh, models of reality. And again, that's fine. But if we do truly believe, right? And this is something we need to think about. If we truly believe that mind emotions are this integral part of our body, which is one continuum, that mind and body are not totally separate, then to say that one acupuncture system only treats physical pain or one system really better treats emotions is a dichotomy that's not at all rooted in our core belief of the, the, the idea that there's a thoroughgoing interconnection, integration between mind and body, right? Uh, I can't remember the, the the name of the back pain guru in New York City who who at one point he was a Western doctor. Um, he basically said, you know, don't do surgery, don't do uh, don't do physical therapy, don't do massage, don't do acupuncture. We basically, we do group therapy and figure out how our stress is related to our back pain, right? So if we believe that we can treat the body, the chi and blood with acupuncture, oh, that's right, it's, it's John Sarno, right? Thank you, Aaron. If we believe that we can do this, then it stands to reason that psychotherapy can treat pain, trigger point acupuncture can treat psychotherapy. If it's all connected, right? For us to say one acupuncture system is better at X, Y, Z and the other is better at ABC, then that is a false dichotomy that just shows our lack of understanding of how we actually work with our patients, right? So if you practice Dong's acupuncture well, you can treat psycho-emotional level just as good as a Worsley practitioner. If you do Worsley well, you can treat physical pain just as good as a Dong practitioner, right? And if to say you can't, this goes back to one of the quotes we saw the other day from the, from the Ling Shu, you know, to say that a disease is, to say that a disease is incurable means that we haven't gotten the necessary level of skill, right? So today is going to be a brief exploration of this idea of how we can look at mind, affect, emotions, spirit, however you want to couch it with Dong's acupuncture. This is not an exhaustive discussion. These are some of my musings over time. Um, people may have other experience as well, and I would encourage all of us to start talking about this because, again, it's really important. We're all currently in the tail end of and again, I don't want to devolve into discussion about in too depth, too depth, in depth in inter pandemic stuff. But clearly, we're all living at the tail end uh, of a pandemic. And most of my patients are under an incredible amount of stress that I haven't seen in a long time. You know, I practice in the in the New York area, and I haven't seen over the last couple of years. I haven't seen this general level of stress in the New York area uh, since right after 9/11. Uh, you know, quite some time ago now, uh, there was a general, uh, there was a general sort of level of stress because I live 25 miles from Manhattan. In the general, in everybody who came in, whether or not they were directly affected, everyone was directly affected to some extent. Whether or not they were there, they were directly affected in this area. 
So this is, I think, a really important uh, topic. And I would like to say it's important, really important for now, but it's honestly really important for all times. OK, that's sort of the background. The other piece of the background here is that when we get to the discussion of Japanese psychotherapy and other methods, uh, we'll talk about qi, uh, Qigong deviation at the end of the class. Um, one of the classes I teach, so I, I teach at Pacific College of Health and Science. I've taught there, uh, taught there since 2006, so quite a long time. Um, one of the classes I, I teach medical classics there. I teach Neijing, Nanjing. I don't teach Shang Hanlun, but I teach the acupuncture classics. Uh, but an, a, one of the electives I teach is an elective in psychoemotional. Uh, I, I think we call it spirit, emotional and spiritual healing in Asia. And my goal in that class is to not mention acupuncture a single time and to not mention herbs a single time, because there are also other methods of dealing with mind and affect that are deeply rooted within East Asian culture, history, uh, practice, uh, medical practice that are very, very rich and offer quite a lot, uh, I think, to modern clinicians, even modern clinicians living in the West. You know, the first step is to understand them on their own terms, and then we can modify, think about how we can change it that's more meaningful to us and our patients. Um, but so today I'll give you an introduction to Merida therapy, um, which is still practiced today, both in Japan and the United States. Uh, Donnie did a great job at, at, uh, at, at, at throwing those, those words, those newer words out there. That's excellent. Um, we'll talk about Merida therapy. We'll talk about an offshoot of Merida therapy called meaningful life therapy. And then we'll talk about, <laughs> then we'll talk about Nikon. Uh, and, which is a really a beautiful, initially not a method of psychotherapy, but a, a method of introspection that is sort of a secularized spiritual uh, introspective practice that has been extended to use in psychotherapy. And I'll give you some even some research citations about that. Um, these are particular. These are are in my own personal life they've been invaluable, um, but I will also say that in my clinical practice the basic principles, especially of Merida therapy, I found more useful than just about anything else in, in doing basic patient counseling. Again, not psychotherapy, I'm not a psychotherapist, but all of you who are in practice know that you have to talk to your patients, right? <laughs> I have a, a friend of mine, a close friend of mine is a veterinarian who does acupuncture. <laughs> yeah. And I always like, how do you, how do you treat, how do you do all this treatment? Like you can't ask your patient, how does it feel? What's going on? What's happening? You know, and her, her, <laughs> her flip side is how do you deal with it with actually having to talk to patients? You know, she's much better off not having to talk to her patients the same way uh, on the same level of engagement as we do. <laughs> so we, we each don't envy the other's uh, position. I guess you get used to what you what you get used to. Um, but all of us have to deal with talking with our patients, giving suggestions about how to best go about uh, you know everything. So this will be a brief introduction and I'll give you some resources if you find it's interesting enough you want to delve into it. Um, so first let's uh, just do a brief overview of Dong's acupuncture. So I know some of you here today were here yesterday. How many of you here today um, are uh, are really sort of brand new to Dong's acupuncture? Either this is your first weekend, um, you can write first if it's your first weekend in the chat room, or if it's uh, if you are relatively new, you can write new. Okay. There are a lot of you who are relatively new or early on in your study. Uh, I know some of you here uh, are, are really experienced in Dong's acupuncture, which only makes me a little nervous. But as we'll see with uh, Japanese, acu uh, Japanese psychotherapy methods, I would take the nervousness with me for the ride and accept it for what it is, which is fine. I'm not really that nervous. But I, I, what we should have done in retrospect is actually flip these topics with today being on Saturday and then the Neijing discussion being on Sunday. Um, so today what I will do is spend a little more time giving you more of a sort of detailed overview of some of the basic theoretical concepts that we'll potentially use to understand. Yesterday we talked about, and for those of you watching this in the future, um, we did a, uh, alongside the same weekend, we did our, our lesson on using Neijing and Nanjing treatment uh, strategies and how they're expressed in Dong's acupuncture. This is, in my in my creation of the class thought to be a, a sort of an intermediate advanced level class. Today we can, today I'm going to try to make this both useful and, uh, and understandable for people who are relatively new to the system. So the first, first hour or two, we'll be doing more of an overview and some of you will be a, a review. 
although reviews are always good, every time I teach the material, it's it unfolds something slightly differently in my own understanding of it, which is one of the reasons I like teaching. One of the reasons I love teaching the Neijing is keep, can, when we continue interacting with these texts, every, every time we do it, something different unfolds over time, over time, over time. So anyway, uh, for those of you who are watching from the future, the other class is certainly there. It's a, a more detailed look at some of the core strategies and how it relates to classical texts. Um, those of you who are here today, but uh, uh, you know, those of you who are here today, thank you, Susan. I noticed your name, and you're the reason I have to be on my game today. <laughs> um, but those of you who are here yesterday and who are relatively new, what I would suggest is taking today's material, going back and look at your notes or the handouts from yesterday, or even reviewing the reviewing the video. And I think it'll you'll see it in you'll see it in a slightly hopefully uh, a deeper light, right? So anyway. The basic, we won't spend too much time on the history of Dong's acupuncture, but I'll give you a very basic overview just so you have an idea. Dong's acupuncture, uh, and we use the T-U-N-G spelling typically. This is the Wade Giles spelling, the, the pinyin spelling of the name, which is one that's more, the pinyin spelling is are, are more used in modern academia is D-O-N-G. So the, the name is Dong. So Dong's acupuncture, if you're confused about the spelling, it's the same name, just different romanization systems. Dong's acupuncture is a family lineage of medicine. Um, and if we believe the story that the family has given us, it's a family lineage of medicine that comes down to us from the from high antiquity, well, maybe not high antiquity, but from a long time ago, that was passed down from father to son over the course of many, many generations until we get to the beginning of the 20th century, where a person by the name of uh, still Dong family uh, Dong Jingchang. He was uh, he was born in the early years of the Chinese Republic, in Shandong Province, which is sort of the northeast part of China. Uh, if you want a deeper historical, uh, not necessarily that deep, but a, a, a written historical overview, you can look at uh, the Practical Atlas of Dong's Acupuncture I did with Dr. Ross. There's a, a short chapter of that in the beginning of the book. Um, as a young man in the really the late 19 teens and the early 1920s, he would have studied alongside of his father. And he uh, basically learned acupuncture that way. This is certainly a very tumultuous time period in Chinese history. And when he was in his teens also, he he actually joined the, the Guomindang army military. The Guomindang were the nationalists. This was the, the main... Uh, this was the ruling political group in China during the pre-Maoist period, right? Post-Qing, the Qing dynasty falls in 1911, Mao Zedong takes over in 1949. And so in that interim period of time, it's the Guomindang, or the nationalists, um, who are in charge. He's a member of the Guomindang army. Um, he is uh, enlisted and eventually, of course, to make a very, not so long a story, but to make a long a story a little shorter, in 1949, when the communists under Mao Zedong basically reigned victorious in mainland China, the Guomindang, something like 2 million people in a very short time all go to Taiwan, right? So they all went to Taiwan, including the military, because if you were in the Guomindang military and you knew it was good for you, after 1949, you got out of town, you got out of Dodge, and you basically, the place where you went was Taiwan, right? And now we have uh, Chiang Kai-shek, who is the, the you know, generalissimo, he's the, the de facto leader uh, the actual leader, de facto president. There's not. This is not an elected office yet, right? Um, Taiwan's government doesn't really have democratic elections for decades uh, after the after the move to Taiwan in 1949. So Master Dong went along with the the military and whatever family he had left, and he basically established himself in Taipei. In Taipei, Taipei is the Taipei is the capital of Taiwan. Uh, at some point in the 1960s, he retires from military practice and opens his own private clinic for the first time. And when he's there, he has this sort of decision he needs to make. So traditionally, this was something that was only taught to family members, this system. Um, from what I understand, he had a son and his, his he had no heirs interested in learning how to do his system. Um, and he started taking people from the outside, uh, outside of the family. So this is in the 1960s, he's actually starting to... So while he's in the military, he's practicing acupuncture informally on other members of the military, right? Um, he actually becomes fairly well known for this. And, and the history is that eventually 
he becomes a very well-known acupuncturist in Taipei, and he's, he's brought in to treat all sorts of high-level military officials. As I mentioned yesterday, in the early 1970s, he's sent to Cambodia. It basically is like a cultural ambassador of goodwill from the government of Taiwan to work on Lo Nol's uh, post-stroke rehabilitation. Um, but in the 1960s, he retires from military practice. I don't know the exact year. And then at some point in the early 1960s, he decides to take students from outside of the family. I believe the first student he took was someone named Lin Ju Chu. So Dr. Lin was the was one of his first students from, he didn't have any students in the family, no one in the family wanted to learn. He was also touched by something called the cultural renaissance movement. So most of you have probably heard the basic history of China from the middle of the 1960s, roughly 1965-ish to 1975 is the cultural revolution in China, in mainland China. And this is a time period where all sorts of traditional Chinese culture is basically torn down, right? Then they, they had the slogan of the four olds, like old customs, old thoughts. I don't remember all of the, the my modern Chinese history is, is a bit rusty. But basically in mainland China, they're trying to get rid of all this old stuff. Confucianism becomes, or Ruism as we are trying to call it now, becomes something that is not a good thing anymore. Um, and Chinese medicine does suffer during this time period, I would say. Uh, and some TCM, very well regarded TCM doctors basically go out of practice or, or marginalized. Um, and what happens, Chiang Kai-shek, Chiang Kai-shek and Mao Zedong were always butting heads with each other. Chiang Kai-shek says, you know what? You guys are tearing down culture. I want to preserve culture. So he establishes something called the Cultural Renaissance Movement in Taiwan. And uh, Master Dong had already taken some students by the time this starts, but he was touched by this, by this sentiment. And he decided he wanted to leave his, his, his contribution to Chinese culture was his family medicine. And he wanted to teach it more widely. Right. And so in 1968, he writes a set of uh, basically notes, teaching notes, because he starts taking students in classes even. Um, and then uh, in, I think it was 1971, there was a book in Taiwan published with a chapter of his family acupuncture points in it. And then 1973 is when he, he, he didn't write it, but his student Yuan Guobun uh, basically ghost writes the book on Dong's acupuncture, which becomes the sort of the the basis for most other books written after that, right? So it, it gives, and it's actually fairly basic. The book is fairly simple. And you can find it online these days because you can find anything online in PDF format. But the base, the book, the book just gives a little bit of a background and then basically just lists the points. Point after point after point, what the point, where is it located and what does it, what does it do? Where is it located? What does it do? Where is it located? What does it do? It has a couple of extra interesting chapters. It has a chapter, for example, on Dong family dietary therapy. Uh, which I've translated for myself because it's kind of interesting. I haven't published my translation of it yet. Um, it has a chapter on how do I, how does Master Dong use conventional acupuncture points, um, which uh, I translated. It's been translated a couple of times, but I was kind of unsatisfied with some of the translations that were there. So I translated it again, and Dr. Ross and I wrote some commentary to it. Um, and so that's included in the practical atlas. And uh, from there, it went on and on, right? So Master Dong had lots of students in Taiwan, 70 plus students in Taiwan who really studied with him. Uh, he had some other casual students come in now and then, um, and he continued to, to teach. And then certainly people like Miriam Lee, one of our great elders in the field in American acupuncture, brought the system to the United States very early on. And then over time, just continued to spread and spread and spread and spread. So I can only, uh, the, the Master Dong's own personal ending is, is, is somewhat of a sad story. We don't really have to go into today. Um, but basically, he was denied a license uh, in the early 1970s, uh, and there was all sorts of, I think, political reasons why that happened. Um, so he basically left his clinical practice, and he died fairly young um, of stomach cancer. So I can only hope that, uh, you know, if there is an afterlife somewhere, and I hope there is, because as you know, there are a couple of, uh, a couple of commentators on the Nanjing that I really want to sit down and have tea with in the afterlife someday. Um, I can only hope that he's wherever he is, he's happy that his family system is, in my opinion, making an incredible contribution to world acupuncture now that it's really spreading all over the place. So that's the really sort of basic history of where Dong's acupuncture comes from, for those of you who are really relatively new to the system. Let's talk about some of the characteristics of Dong's acupuncture. And again, for those of you who are new, this may make some of yesterday's discussion on Nanjing and Nanjing treatment strategies make a little bit more sense as we go through some of this. First of all, one of the most uh, obvious system, obvious features of the system is the extensive use of extra points. 
right? So most people know that there are all these weird points with these weird numbers, and we'll talk about the weird numbering system. Because if for those of you who are brand new, yesterday must have been like for the numbering system. So we'll, I'll explain why there's a numbering system and what it tries to do. But we know that there's extensive use of unique extra points, right? So these extra points are sometimes in the same place as conventional acupuncture points. There's definitely overlapping of points. They're only, I mean, let's be honest, there are only so many places in the body you can stick a needle. So that's, uh, you know, that's, to, that's there. Many of the points, though, exist in different locations, right? And so the different locations are interesting, I believe, because it should challenge us to consider what is it that we're putting a needle into, right? I will say this out loud, and I've said this in the past, uh, and people can certainly disagree with me. And we'll, we'll talk about this. But fundamentally, I don't believe in acupuncture points. I, 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 I don't believe that stomach 36 is anything special. But yet stomach 36 happens to be special, right? And so we have to sort of wrap our head around this, this sort of, you know, if we're told that in like conventional T, and I will say throughout the lecture today, I will say TCM acupuncture, just as an easy way to say conventional 12 channel do and plus do and ren where most of us study acupuncture, acupuncture. With no disrespect to Korean acupuncture, Japanese acupuncture, or other systems of Chinese acupuncture, I'll just refer to it most often as either conventional or TCM acupuncture. And I, what I just mean is the points that most of us study. And obviously there's gonna be some variation, but I'm not gonna worry about that. I'll sort of juxtapose that with Dong's acupuncture because there are a lot of other points in Dong's acupuncture that are not, not in TCM acupuncture. So we have to wrap our head around this seeming, this, this potential incongruity in that, you know, if TCM acupuncture is right, how can Dong's acupuncture be right and vice versa? And I'm going to suggest that perhaps it's because acupuncture points don't really exist. I mean, they exist and they don't exist at the same time. And I'll explain exactly what I mean by that statement shortly, right? So just chew on that idea and we'll, I'll explain exactly what I mean. But in Dong's acupuncture, we have all these points that are in different locations that sometimes have different functions. And even again, when they overlap, they have potentially different uses, right? So, you know, Master Dong will say, for example, heart five, I use for sciatica. Not too many TCM acupuncturists do that. Maybe some do, but it maybe it might be a little bit different, right? So what the differences should do is it should make us think, what is it that I'm trying to do when I'm sticking a needle in a patient's body? And what mechanisms am I potentially triggering? If you can do that, even if you start just thinking more deeply about what is it that I'm trying to do, even if you never use these dong points in your clinical practice, hopefully it will make you a more reflective and thoughtful practitioner of any acupuncture system. So if you, you know, email me a month from now and say, you know, it was a good lecture, but I'd never use those points ever in my clinic. As long as you think more deeply about your own system, then, then you, it's a win. For me, it's totally a win. Okay. So the next thing we will notice is that there is almost an extensive, there's an almost exclusive rather use of distant point treatment. And as I said yesterday, I'm trying to get us to stop saying distal point because they're not always distal, right? This is a misnomer. And it's a misuse of the word distal. Distal is an anatomical direction, which means away from the trunk, right? So if you have whatever, shoulder pain and you needle the hand, you have hip pain, you needle the foot, that's a distal treatment, right? If you use gallbladder 30 to treat foot pain or bladder 40 to treat foot pain, that's not distal, it's proximal, right? So the point of it, no pun intended, maybe there was, is that where we put the needles are mostly away from the site of disease. Not 100% of the time, but mostly away from the site of disease. Also, most of the time we're needling, we're needling opposite side of the body. When we're bleeding, we're typically bleeding same side of the body. Um, but again, we can do that eventually by palpation rather than just by, the rule is there just as a guidepost, but eventually we have to see what the, the, the patient's body is asking for. There's usually a minimal number of needles per treatment. Uh, you know, I had heard always that Master Dong typically used six or fewer needles. That doesn't mean six points bilateral. That's cheating. That's 12, uh, 12 needles. Uh, so we use a small number of, 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 of treatment. Yeah, Dale, non-local, it's probably even better to say non-local point treatment. 
you know, really to be specific. So these six needles are all non-local, right? They're distant away from the site of disease for the most part and minimal, right? So I'm going to suggest to you, and one of the reasons why this resonated with me when I was an undergraduate at Oberlin in, uh, in, in Ohio, I had, uh, I actually, I, I tell people I had, the reason I first got acupuncture is I had martial arts related injuries. It's only because they don't understand when I say something else. And what it really was, was Qigong related injuries. And I'll say that today because we're gonna be talking about Qi deviation at the end of the class as, uh, as a topic. And I, I, I wanted to talk about it because it's not something I hear people really talk too much about. Um, and it's something that I think is an important topic for us to at least be aware of. So I hurt myself doing Qigong. I went to see an acupuncturist, a really, really talented acupuncturist from, acupuncturist from southern, southern China, practicing in the Cleveland area. And I remember, you know, I didn't know anything. I remember asking him, I said, you know, how many needles do you use? These, all these typical questions. And um, he looked at me. Uh, and he looked at me and he said, you know what? If your acupuncturist needs more than 10 needles, they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> he was a very opinionated uh, from the Chinese doctor from Southern China. You know, I remember I, I had an herbal formula and I asked him, you know, from a different doctor that I tried first, which didn't really work. And I remember asking him, do you, do you think I should take more of this herbal formula? And he looked and said, you can do it. It won't help you at all, but you can take more if you want to, <laughs> right? So that was... Um, that was that was a uh, that was an interesting discussion. So it was always in the back of my head that a small number of needles was perhaps a desirable uh, thing to do in clinical practice. I'm not saying that a larger number of needles is is automatically a bad thing. I want to be clear about that. But what I'm saying is that if you think you need a lot of needles to get treatment effect, that's not a correct way of thinking. If you like to use a lot of needles, or if you have a patient that feels better. With, with when you do a lot of needles psychologically or physically, whatever it happens to be, you can use more needles. But if you think that the only way to get treatment effect is to use 20, 30, whatever needles, that's simply a fallacious it, statement. It's, it's, it's a wrong way of thinking. It's simply not true. There are plenty of really good acupuncturists who use a few number of needles that get great effect. So this should challenge us, even if you're doing TCM treatments, it should hopefully challenge us, how can I really sort of streamline my approach to best treat this patient. And what Dale typed in there is, I think, correct. The essential principle is not, you, you, don't, you don't know, it's like when I, literally in my clinic, if I'm putting 12, 13, 14, 15 needles in, I start to think, I don't understand what's going on in this patient. And I have those moments too. We all have those moments. Once in a while, I'm confused. And I find when I'm thinking, oh, I need one more needle, it's because I'm confused about what I'm really trying to do. So that's a characteristic of Dong's acupuncture. There's also a use of a special point combination and stimulation techniques, including bloodletting, and we'll talk about that as we go through. So first of all, about uh, the points, we'll talk about the, the, the Dong lineage points. First is that they're organized by, uh, by zone of distribution. We'll talk about uh, using like one Dama group per limb. You don't even have to use so someone's asking, do you have to use one Dhamma group per limb? You don't have to needle all limbs. Sometimes I needle one leg and that's the entire treatment. Sometimes I needle one leg and two arms, it's an entire treatment. One of the case studies I gave yesterday, we needled one leg with, uh, with actually one and a third Dhamma groups. And we needled uh, one point in each arm and called it a day. And we did Moxa, right? So it's not, there's not a hard, fast rule you have to do you know, Master Dong, if we look at the case studies, and for those of you who are interested in looking more at the case studies translated into English, Dr. Wong's book, and again, Dr. Wong has done classes here on eLotus. He has uh, translated quite a lot of very short but interesting case studies into English in his book on Dong's acupuncture. And Master Dong did not typically needle all four limbs, right? Very rarely. He would sometimes do just like the lower three emperors on just the leg, and that's the entire treatment, right? And not necessarily bilaterally. Um, one of the things I will tell you is that in my clinic, I never do four needles only because four needles rhymes with death in Chinese and I'm a superstitious person at heart. So all my patients know if I put four needles in and they see me scratching my head, they know, all right, you gotta put one more needle in. You can't leave four, four is bad luck. So don't do four needles on your patients. Always put five needles in or, or three or just don't do four. Even if you don't speak Chinese, maybe your needles do. I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna risk it. So the points themselves though, the points are organized by zone of distribution rather than channels. And this is just the, so 
And it will be clear here to say that we can understand the points via the, the concept of channels and channel connections, et cetera. However, the grand organizing principle is not by channels. And what I mean here is they're organizing buckets. So in, in TCM school, when you went to acupuncture school, like me, you probably learned, okay, let's do lung channel. We're going to do lung one, down to lung 11. Now let's do large intestine channel. We start with one, we do the whole channel. So all sorts of channels we learned, this channel, here are the points. This channel, here's the points. In Dong's acupuncture, and because the points, look at, you know, open up a book on acupuncture, most modern books in acupuncture, and not all books in, in the past were done this way, actually, but most modern books in acupuncture, it's chapter one, lung channel, chapter two, large intestine channel. That's what I mean as the channels as organizing principle. In Dong's acupuncture, the organizing principle is the zone of distribution. And the zone of distribution is the anatomical location where these points are found. So these are the zones of distribution, zone one through 10, and we have the ventral and dorsal trunks. So when I say zone one, I mean fingers. Zone two is the palm and the dorsal hand, three, the forearm, four, the upper arm, five, the plantar aspect of the foot, six, the dorsal foot, and you can see the rest. Seven is the leg, roughly from uh, ankle to knee, eight is knee up, uh, up the rest of the leg, nine is the ear, 10 is the head and face. So 10 is the whole head and face. And then we have the ventral and dorsal trunks. Now, you can see the number of points distributed in each of the zones. The, just so you can understand, the, the first number is the number of points that was found in Master Dong's original book. The parentheses are the additional points. So it's on zone one, we have 27 plus 55 additional points that we've added in the current edition of the Atlas. And these are points that are translated from the Taiwanese literature. Um, so remember Master Dong, as I mentioned this yesterday, he didn't put all his points in his book. And we don't know why. We don't know if he decided, oh, I'm going to use the points in the book that are more commonly used or that I think are the better points. Maybe he wanted to keep a little for himself, right? Um, in some of the Taiwanese authors, they have lists of secret Dong family points. When I was first taught, I was actually taught these secret points and I was, I was told, if you really want to know if someone knows Dong's acupuncture, you ask them, do you know where this point is? Because it's not in any book. And if they don't, then they don't really do it, which is kind of crazy because all sorts of different students of Master Dong learned different secret points, so to speak. Um, so, you know, it's, but there were other points basically that Master Dong didn't put in his book that his students eventually started putting in books. You know, I always thought if you're teaching me this secret point and someone told you never to teach to anyone else, then there's, it's just a weird system. I, I, I'm too American to deal with this sort of, <laughs> Victoria, all the secret points are now in the book. Don't worry. If you want a really secret point that I didn't put in the book, I have a special price for that when you get to come visit me in New Jersey. <laughs> okay. But in addition to the points that Master Dong himself used that he didn't, that he didn't include in his book, other students of Master Dong started creating more points based on the same logic that Master Dong's system sort of plays with, which we'll see more of, and based on their own clinical experience, right? So, I mean, I have my own points that I've made up. They're not really making up because it's still based on yin yang five phase and channel concepts, right? Nothing under the sun is new because the universe is just the universe. We're not creating something totally new that where the possibility didn't exist previously. So we are, one of my goals is to try to bring more of these points into the English language literature. And I can't say I use all these points all the time, but studying them helps me understand, I think, the other points, what they do, their relationships to each other, et cetera. So I think it's worth reading and understanding what these points are and why different doctors in Taiwan and other places are, are using these, these other points, right? So, but these are the zones of distribution. Now, the reason why one of, one of the reasons this is important is because every zone functions almost like a microsystem, okay? Which means in zone one, we have points that treat the entire body. In zone two, we have points that treat the entire body. In zone three, we have points that treat, again, all the five zong, the entire body, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is one of the key aspects that we play with, play with with Dong's acupuncture is this idea of microsystem. And honestly, I think it's a key aspect that we can play with even in conventional TCM acupuncture, right? So this should help this should make us start thinking about what am I doing? <clears throat> so after that, we have the numbering system. 
Remember, every point has a name in Chinese. The names uh, are useful, and I'm going to suggest to you that you should learn the names instead of the numbers. I think the numbering system is, is pretty only moderately useful at best. Um, and I'll explain why it's only moderate, moderately useful at best. Uh, I, would, I would suggest to you strongly that you try to learn the name of the point. I suggest to you strongly you should learn the name of TCM points. I think it's a great tragedy that we teach our students lung one, lung two, lung three, rather than teaching them the names of the points. The names of the points tell us a lot about what the points do, where they're located, how we use them in combination, et cetera. I don't care if you learn it in Chinese, if you learn it in Korean, if you learn it in English translation, it doesn't really matter, but learn the name of the points. So as we go through this, if you have a question about a point and you type it into the box, we, this happened yesterday, if you put what happens to point seven, seven point whatever, I may or may not know what, what your point you're referring to simply by the number, right? Um, so if you ask a question about a point, please include either the English translation, which I, I'm sure I'll recognize, or the opinion, because um, it will help. That said, there was a numbering system that was created basically for ease of people for whom an Asian language is not their native language, or people who can't read Chinese characters, or, or just haven't taken the time to learn the, the names. Um, so someone asked about grasping the, grasping the wind for learning point names is great because it gives us stories about all the point names. Uh, so th there, are, there are books out there that describe the point names in English that it's, we have plenty of resources. So the numbering system though in Dong's acupuncture, you'll notice it's kind of this funny numbering system where you have, for example, Linggu, which means numinous bone or miraculous bone, followed by this number, it says 22.05. Right, what the hell is that? So let me explain what the hell that is. The numbering system 22.05 tells us two things. The first part of the numbering system, in my opinion, is the only really useful part of the numbering system. The first part, number two, basically tells us that this point is located on zone two, right? So the reason why the, the, the number is doubled is simply because of a, a, a snafu in Chinese language that is different between numbers and numerals, okay? Um, at which if you're not a Chinese speaker, it, you know, it, you don't have to worry about. So for the reason, for example, in Master Dong's book where he has the section numbers, instead of writing section, the Chinese number two R and then the number Bu for section, because if you write just the single number two and the, the character for Bu, instead of R Bu, it's Liang Bu, which means two sections, not section number two. So to clarify it, he simply writes two, two, then the word section. Some authors will simply write this as 2.05. Some authors write it 22.05. It's the same thing. So the number tells us the zone. So if a point is one, one point something, it means it's on the fingers. If a point is five, five point something, it's on the bottom of the foot. I will caution you also for those of you who read Chinese, some of the authors out of Taiwan the, ex the, the association of some points with zone five and six gets a little hazy and there's some disagreement. In uh, my writing, I, I follow the, the dominant sort of schematic organization that we see in most English language texts and basically all English language texts. But in, in, because there's no numbering system in Chinese, none of the points of a number, it's not, it's not cast in stone for zone five and six. So there's some disagreement there. But in our book and in most modern books, you'll see five, five point something means the bottom of the foot. Seven, seven point something, it's on the leg or calf, right? Et cetera, et cetera. 10, 10 point something, it's on the head or the face, right? So that's the numbering system for the first part. The second part, the 0.05, just tells us the order that the point originally appeared when it was first put into writing in Master Dong's own book. So it doesn't mean that number five is necessarily next to number whatever, right? So for example, on the, uh, you know, on the hand, Lingu is number five, you know, number six goes all the way over here, right? So five and six are nowhere near each other. This is, this is 22.01 here, okay? I think that's a one. See, again, in the numbering, I don't even remember, but this is, you know, four and five, 2204, 2205, and then six is all the way over here. They're not necessarily next to each other. One is in between them. So unlike in, in, in conventional acupuncture, at least the numbering system gives us some idea of the sequential order in which the points appear on any channel distribution, right? So we know that lung five is somewhere between lung four and lung six. 
right? Lingu is not somewhere between 2204 and 2206. So the, the, the second part is only based on the order the points were presented originally in Master Dong's book. Okay. As we go through this, you'll see some of the points don't have a number. The points in my presentation that don't have a number are points that Master Dong did not include in his own original book. Okay. So I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I don't think that I'm qualified or an expert enough to simply create new numbers. Right. So that's not my project. It's not, it's not my monkey, not my circus. Okay. That's some, for someone else to deal with. So if you see a point without a number, just know it was, it was a point that comes from another source besides Master Dong's own original book, probably from Master Dong himself, but not from his own original book. Okay. That's the numbering system. Originally, the points were not associated with channels, but rather with something that Master Dong called reflex area, Shenjing. So the word Shenjing, reflex area, literally means, the word Shenjing in Chinese means nerve. So Master Dong would have said, for example, Linggu belongs to the lung nerve. Now, the reason they translate it as reflex area, some authors translate it as reaction area, is because they're simply too embarrassed to write lung nerve, okay? And because that's what Master Dong wrote. The reason he did this, though, was basically because he, one of his efforts, uh, let me see, I don't think I discussed this in the presentation today. One of the things that Master Dong tried to do was he tried to adopt modern medical terminology. And he says this in his own writing. He basically says, I'm adopting modern language to try to popularize this old system of medicine. Okay. So, Many times we'll see even disease names listing that use modern medical terms. So for example, there's this point on the shoulder called Jianzhong's middle of the shoulder, 44.0 something, I don't, don't even ask me. But it's, he says it's used to treat post-polio syndrome. Okay? Now, I can tell you, I can count on my hand the number of patients in, in decades of practice, in over two decades of practice, that I've seen with post-polio syndrome. I've seen a few, but clearly not a whole lot in suburban New Jersey. Does that mean that I can never use this point for other things? Clearly, no. Why? Because the point does not, and I'll, I'll, I mean, I say this emphatically because you need to understand this. The point does not treat post-polio syndrome. I mean, it does and it doesn't. Chinese medicine treats Chinese disease nosologies. It doesn't treat Western disease nosologies, unless there's an exact association. Sometimes there is, but a lot of the times there's not. So when Master Dong says post-polio syndrome, what Chinese disease name, because post-polio syndrome is not a Chinese medicine disease name, what Chinese medicine disease name sort of looks kind of maybe could be close to post-polio syndrome? So I'm not talking about a pattern diagnosis. I'm talking about a disease name. In Chinese medicine, we have both disease diagnosis, we have bian bing, and we have bian zheng, pattern diagnosis. So B syndrome, maybe, but what happened in post-polio syndrome, where we have potentially sort of like weakness and what, so even like, right, Deborah got it, right? It's way syndrome. Again, not wind. Wind is not a disease. Wind is a pattern. And some stroke may fall under something similar, right? Because what we're talking about is way atrophy, right? Wasting syndrome. So wasting syndrome, why? Because we can have this, this wasting of the limb. Post-stroke can be wasting syndrome. Multiple sclerosis can be wasting syndrome. So when Master Dome says this point treats post-polio syndrome, we have to realize he didn't really mean post-polio syndrome. This is his modernization, his attempt at modernization, right? Which means that that point, why? Because it's an area of thick flesh, and we'll see that areas of thick flesh treat problems of the flesh, which includes wasting disorder. That's why in the Neijing, it says the Yang Ming treats wasting. Why does the Yang Ming treat it? Because the Yang Ming is full of qi and blood, but it's distributed in areas of thick flesh. We needle flesh to treat disorders of the flesh. We needle flesh to treat disorders of the spleen earth or the spleen soil. Get the idea? So that means at that point can be used for stroke, can be, right, exactly. 
it so it can be used for any of these conditions that are not post polio but have a similar clinical appearance. Why? Because it treats a Chinese medical nosology, not a Western medicine one. So when Master Dong said this was a reflex area, what he basically meant was this was the lung channel. And he's basically, what that means then is that this point has some sort of tropism, some sort of affinity with the lung as the zong organ. Get it? So it's not really a nerve. The reflex area was Master Dong's original concept of how points relate to certain Chinese medicine organs. Right, exactly, Thomas. It's in resonance with somehow. Now we can look at it just by saying, okay, Master Dong said it, it goes to the lung, or we can try to understand it through different aspects of channel associations, imaging associations, et cetera. So yeah, Aaron, the point we were talking about was Jen Dong, shoulder center. So Lingu is, the, sorry, originally with lung, Lingu was what we're talking about on the slide here. The example with wasting was Jen Dong on the shoulder, was shoulder center. Okay, so far so good? All right. Now, not all the zones are exactly the same. So even though all the zones can function as microsystems, they're not all exactly the same. Different zones basically have slightly different characteristics. In general, it's thought in Dong's acupuncture, the finger, hands, and head. So we're looking at zones one, two, and 10, treat more acute conditions. We use them to get, and it's not necessarily only acute conditions. It can be chronic conditions, but how can we get symptom management happening potentially faster? The leg and the thigh, especially the thigh, so this is now zone seven and eight, tend to be used to treat more ongoing chronic recalcitrant conditions. They're thought to have a, a beneficial effect as a global regulator of zong organ function. Right, and there are going to be some exceptions to this rule all the time. Certainly we will sometimes use points in the, on the lower extremities to treat acute conditions, but these are some general characteristics that you should keep in the back of your head. And we talk about why these are the general characteristics based on yin yang concepts. So if you weren't here yesterday, I'm not gonna tell you the answer right yet because honestly, there's no answer. There's only different uh, us thinking about these answers. And I'll actually, I'll give you a little aside here. One of the other things we have to understand is that Master Dong himself talked very little about theory. So the theory is what we have to do to reconstruct potentially what maybe he didn't think this way, but maybe his father did, maybe his grandfather did, I don't know. But since Master Dong didn't really talk that much about theory, we have to sort of reverse engineer it from what we see about the system. What we And this is why I think studying the Neijing and Nanjing is important because it helps us understand the theory as to why we are doing certain things. So that's just the caveat in terms of the theory. So what you wanna to try to think about is what is it about yin yang and five phases and how that works within the body that says, yeah, that works. Why am I using one, two, and 10 to get more acute symptom management where seven and eight, right? Seven and eight is maybe not so. So the upper arm is not as associated with chronicity as, or that organ regulation to the same extent zone seven and eight. And so that, that's what you want to chew on, right? So think about that in the back of your head. What is it about the arm versus the leg? And if we get half time, we can come back to this discussion. Otherwise, uh, otherwise in the atlas, I have a, the, the practical atlas that I wrote with Dr. Ross, I have a, an essay um, on, on the topic, uh, specifically on the topic. Okay, the last piece is the trunk points are mostly bled, they're not needled. So all the points, and we'll see some points in, when we go through commonly used points, all the points on the chest and the back in Dong's acupuncture for the most part are bloodletting points. And I don't mean needle them or bloodlet them. Master Dong said these points you do not needle, you only do bloodletting on these points with a few exceptions, right? There are, there are definitely a few exceptions. So that's something that's, that's somewhat distinct and different. And maybe you all should think to yourself, why is it, what are those, what's about, what is it about those areas that we should bleed them? But the only points you'll see that, that are Dong's family points that we'll talk about on the trunk are bloodletting points. 
Okay. If you don't do bloodletting, then you figure out something else to do with it. Uh, I, I'm a fan of bloodletting, as most of you know. And uh, so there you have it. We'll, we'll talk more about those points shortly. All right, questions so far? That's sort of the basic, basic, really basic introduction that hopefully some of you should have had yesterday before we dove right into the Neijing. Okay, let's talk a little bit about core theory and then we'll eventually take our first break uh, of the morning and <clears throat> get up and move around a little bit. Um, so if you don't have a lancet, you bleed with a bleeding needle, which I don't, I, I never use a lancet to my practice. I haven't used, I have not touched a lancet in probably 15 years. Um, lancets are super ineffective at, uh, at bleeding. Uh, maybe Donna can give you some other, I think we talk about needles in my bloodletting classes. I've, I've done blood cla bloodletting classes and other, uh, other ELO speakers have done bloodletting classes. For those of you who are interested in bloodletting, just as an aside, um, not last year, the year before, one of the last years in the, uh, I just don't keep, I, you can't, okay, so Aaron's asking about Lancet for the ear apex. You can, I just don't keep them in my practice. I mean, I just, I don't bother buying boxes of Lancets. I just buy bleeding needles, okay? But you can, for the ear apex Lancet and the Jingwell points Lancet is actually does work just fine. On other body points, like in Dong's points, the, the Lancet's relatively, in my opinion, again, you can disagree with me, but in my opinion, relatively ineffectual. Um, the other thing that we have, and maybe Donna can post this, for those of you who do bloodletting, we did a um, we did a two hour safety, right? How to basically do bloodletting a bloodletting safety review uh, that's available uh, through eLotus. It's also available free uh, on um, on YouTube. I think we posted it on YouTube um, for for free viewing. So if you if you don't need your CEU credits for it. Uh, although I think it counts for safety CEUs, you can um, you can actually watch the safety video for free. So if you do bloodletting, I, uh, I I I really strongly suggest you watch the free safety review. It I, it's an important. It was actually I, I remember the first time I, NCCOM asked me to do a safety portion of one of my bloodletting classes, and I sort of grumbled because they wanted more in there. And I was really happy they made me do it because it was an excellent review for me. It was good for me to sort of put my thoughts and really look at what the current literature suggests is best practices and put it down and put it out there for the public. So definitely watch that one. Okay, let's talk about a little bit more core theory. So one of the things we have to realize is that acupuncture is sort of a, um, acupuncture is sort of a black box event. We know that we put a needle in somewhere and something happens in the body and at the other end, something happens to the patient. We get a clinical result. Now, the black box means the causal chains that link us from stimulus to effect are still an area of debate. We don't know 100%, right? We certainly don't know scientifically. There's lots of theories. Oh, it does the hormones. It does connective tissue planes. It's blah, 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 all sorts of stuff. However, the truth is we don't know exactly what, we, what it is from stimulus to effect. So because of that, we need a model of looking at how things relate in the body so as to be able to understand and reliably replicate this stimulus to effect. Okay. So in Dong's acupuncture, the, in my opinion, the core, one of the core, and it's not just Dong's acupuncture. You know, I'll tell you again, I don't fundamentally believe there's Dong's acupuncture, Chinese acupuncture, Korean, Japanese, it's honestly all the same. It's just different algorithms in how we apply what's my priority in treatment, diagnosis, et cetera, right? It's all the same because it is based on the same core theories we see, for example, in the Neijing, Nanjing, based in Yin-Yang, five phases, organ, et cetera, okay? So this is, uh, this is a core idea. So the core idea here is Tian Di Ren He, which means heaven, earth, and humans are in harmony. So essentially humans are a small microsystem or hologram of the natural world. And this is, I think it was Zhang Jiebing in the systematic classic or in the Leijing, the, the categorized classic, the classic of categories that says the human body is a Xiao Tian Di, a small heaven and earth. So one of the main thrusts of the early classical literature is to explain this interconnectedness between the cosmos and us as humans. 
So we essentially are, and this is, as I said before, this is the ancient Chinese sort of expression of the principle we see in Western mysticism, in, in, in Hermeticism, of as above, so below, right? So we are created in the image of the cosmos, essentially. Now, if we believe that we, and so the reason that I have yin yang and five phases in my body is because it's out there. The reason that I have the organs that do what they're supposed to do is because out there, they have all of this movement in, in the universe. Okay. Now, if we believe that this is happening and it's a real thing, right? My connection to the universe. And it's not just some weird fantasy that ancient, stupid ancient people created. Then the logical extension of this is that the small represents the large, right? The piece represents the whole, which is why it's a hologram, okay? So in, in modern parlance, we call this a taiji chuanxi. This is a, a taiji hologram, which basically means in any small part of the body, we have an image of, of wholeness that relates to the larger parts of the body. And this is what we're going to play with. It's understanding all of this interconnectedness between the small and the large that allows us to understand how can we actually start applying acupuncture in clinical practice so as to stimulate these, these relationships for a therapeutic stimulus, for their therapeutic purpose. So what we're going to look at are these various different rules of diagnosis and treatment. We're going to look at, we'll break it down into three pieces, holographic correspondence, channel correspondence, and tissue correspondence. Holographic correspondence is the location, location, location part of the show. So when we have, for example, a disease in the head, let's say someone has headache, right? Or we're looking at uh, psycho-emotional, if it's a problem, let's say we have someone with vascular dementia, right? This is a problem in the head, in the brain. We need to basically, if we're not doing local needling, we basically need to figure out how can I apply a stimulus to the body that gets to the area where the problem is located. Okay. So as we talked about yesterday, there is this principle called Tong Qi Xiang Chou. The same Qi mutually seeks. And this is a, a line that's taken from the Book of Changes in, a, in basically the uh, the writing that relates to the fifth line of the first hexagram, the Qianghua, first hexagram, which means that this is the idea of resonance. What part of the body, if I stimulate, will resonate with the site of disease? This is an essential topic that we need to understand, or at least we need to start understanding as maybe beyond us as humans, but we need to start playing with this idea in order to get Chinese medicine to work. So as I said in other classes, this is the idea that in winter, season affects my body, right? That if I want to stay in harmony, if I want to stay in a state of health, which is what my body naturally wants to do, then I need to do something in my body that mimics the movement of winter, right? When winter happens, it's more yin outside, where we're almost at the most yin day of the year as I'm sitting here, we're a couple of weeks off, the most yin day of the year as I'm sitting here, I need to get myself in bed earlier. We need to rest a little bit more, eat slightly different foods, right? Doing that is what my body naturally wants to do. And what my body, when it does that effectively, keeps me in a state of resonance with the movement of the cosmos that's happening at that given time, right? This is, this is the Tian Zhi Dao. This is the, the way of heaven. Ren Zhi Dao, human, the human way, which the, the, the Dao De Jing talks about is that I want to try to fight that. That's why I'm doomed to be in a state of, 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 of dis-ease, of non-resonance. So the first thing we have to do in acupuncture is look at how can I get a point that has a resonance with area of disease so that if I pluck that string, the area of the disease, which is another string, vibrates sympathetically. That's holographic correspondence, right? Because wherever the disease is, we still have to get a therapeutic stimulus to go there. The second one is channel correspondence, which is basically a similar idea, except rather than doing like a location, how do I get to the head? How do I get to the channel that's diseased? All right, so that's channel correspondence. We can always treat the same channel. If the bladder channel is diseased, we can needle the bladder channel. That's fine. It's not rocket science. However, sometimes 
the option of treating the same channel is not the most ideal option. So we need, we need different potential choices that allows us to get a therapeutic stimulus from one channel to a different channel. And we'll talk about that as well. The last is tissue correspondence. And when I say tissue correspondence, I'm talking about the five tissues as the skin, the vessels, the flesh, the sinew, and the bone. The reason these are important is because they have an association with the five phases and via the five phases, the five zong viscera. Okay. So if we want to stimulate, for example, a, if we want to give a therapeutic stimulus that treats the flesh, muscles, how can I get a stimulus from a point that's not in the site of disease to stimulate again that resonance level that says, okay, go to the, go to the flesh. Or if I want to treat, let's say, the kidneys, how can I needle any given point so that it has an associated resonance with that layer of kidney? And I'll give you some very easy case examples that illustrate this point. Okay, so these are the different sort of con the the aspects of connectivity that we're going to have to play with, so as that we can understand what any given point is going to do. And this will work with TCM points as well. This is not unique to to Dong's points uh, at all. Okay, uh, let's. Uh... Let's go a little bit. Why don't we just go ahead and take our first break here since we're pretty close. Um, why don't you go ahead and come back at, uh, let's see. Fifteen, 15 minutes would be what? What's 15 minutes, Donna? It's uh, 10, 12 your time. So 10, 27, come back at 10, 27. How's that? Yeah, let's just go. Take a take a take a pick fifteen. So get up, move around, ten twenty seven Pacific time, and then we will continue on. So this is a natural sort of breaking off point. Okay. Recording stopped.
Recording in progress. Hello, everyone, and welcome back from break. Before we get started, there's still so much more to see on the Master Dong section on core of our website. So let's continue with the tour. Let's start at the mega menu and let's take an in-depth look at a Master Dong point. On our website, did you know that Master Dong points begin with a T, then a double digit? T stands for Dong and the double digit indicates the point on the body. It starts with 11 on the fingers, 22 the hands, 33 the forearm, and so on. For example, if the point is 77.15, we know that it's somewhere on the lower legs. To find the point, select 77 lower legs, which will display a list of all points on the lower legs. Since this is fairly self-explanatory, I'll take you to browse all dome points to show you how to use the filter. You can search by typing the point name or number, selecting specific zones, or specifying location details, such as whether or not it overlaps with the TCM point. Even though a point overlaps with the traditional point, Master Dung still gave it another name according to his own system. For instance, if I want to know all points located on the finger that does not overlap with the TCM point, I would select 11 and does not overlap the TCM point and a list will generate like so. You can easily read the point location and these symbols will tell you information on whether the point can be used in bloodletting, overlaps with the traditional acupuncture point, or is a rare dome point that is part of the 72 severing points. Let's take a look at zone 11, specifically 11.24 FUCA. So let's click on 11.24 FUCA. This is the famous point for all gynecological disorders. For each dome point, you will see the point number, Chinese names in both traditional and simplified, and the English translation, which is helpful to learn what the pinyin and characters mean. There are also two pictures for this specific point where we show the point location as well as the angle of the needle insertion. Under the location section, you can further see details on specifically where these points are located, as well as the direction in which you should insert the needles. Then we have the indications of how to use this point. The applications, which includes the master dome reactionary areas, much like Dr. Tan's imaging idea. Also, we listed what channel this point is close to if you practice the balance method. Under protocol, we've listed supplementary points that can be added to achieve the Dalma effect. Under techniques, you will see a video in which Dr. Chuan Min Wang demonstrates how to needle this point. We have video demos for the top 100 most popular points. So check them out on our website here or visit our eLotus YouTube channel. Finally, you will see the last section, the remarks section where you can learn clinical gems about this point from Dong's disciples. Read this section and save yourself some time to learn it yourself through trial and error in your own clinic. This is the learn more section of the website, which gives you a great introduction to Dong's acupuncture and allows you to find his points easily. But if you would like to learn more on how to use these points, we have both CEU and free courses available with varying course levels, topics, and speakers. Let's now get back to the mega menu and I can show you where you can start watching the videos for free. We have the most comprehensive video library on Master Dong in our profession. Speakers include Esther Su, Chuan Min Wong, Henry McCann, Brad Wisnat, Robert Chu, Susan Johnson, and more. Get to know them and see what courses they offer at elotus.org. Lastly is our point location demo videos where you can learn how to locate the most commonly used Dong points from Dr. Chuan Min Wang, a direct disciple of Master Dong. These videos are available in six different languages, English, Chinese, Spanish, Portuguese, French, and German. You can also find these videos on our YouTube channel for free under eLotus. Before I wrap up, I want to introduce this great function here in the top right hand corner, our magic search bar. Here you can search for symptoms and find which Dong points to use. For example, let's type in insomnia and out comes these three points. Let's see, let's try neck pain. 
And ta-da, here are a bunch of points that can help with neck pain. You can always type in the chief complaint of your patient and then find the most suitable points. This concludes the tour of our Master Dong's acupuncture website. We hope you find eLotus Court to be a valuable addition to your e-learning with our online CU courses and that it makes your clinic life a little easier. Please feel free to email me at info at elotus.org if you have any questions or comments. Content is continuously being added to this section of our website, and we would really love to hear your feedback. Thank you, and let's go ahead and return to class. Okay. Um, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, the, the the resources really are fantastic, I have to say. So I encourage people to, to definitely make use